the Futsal Focus Network Business Conference. Still having to read it. By the end of tomorrow, I might have mastered that one. And um, welcome back to our audience here at Tranmere's Prenton Park. We just had a, a stadium tour. Um, this is a panel session on player development. I'm going to introduce you to everybody we've got so far. Uh, Keith Tozer is the USA National Futsal Head Coach and Commissioner of the Professional Futsal League, which I think I'm right in saying is starting next year. 19. 19, sorry, thank you very much. Good start at home, mate. Good <laughs> uh, on the far end there, we've got Ian Bateman, is the FA's lead futsal coach educator. I worked with you able to deliver uh, their futsal license. Mm -hmm. We've got that right. Yeah. Good, splendid. Glad we got that sorted out. Uh, well, I mean, this fellow, what can I say? Head coach of, of Finland and also of futsal Dinamo of Croatia, founder of the Futsal Planet and general futsal legend I'm talking about, and I, I apologise again for pronunciation, I'm going to go for Michu Martic. <laughs> <laughs> there really have never been such times. Um, and head coach of, uh, of Tramia Rovers, Damon Shaw is with us as well. Obviously Stephen McGettigan has organised this from Futsal Focus is with us as well. Also on the front row just down here as well, we're going to hear from him tomorrow, but L. Abrahams is the founder of the WA Futsal Centre in Australia. I'm hoping he'll contribute to this. Also Antonio Pesana, head of Futsal at the Sporting Club of Braga. Um, listen, I fessed up this morning. I've been in football for 20 years. I love my football. I love, love, love low league football and the rest of it. I'm not a futsal expert, so I, I can't do this on my own. This is a quite unique opportunity. You guys have all got your own little areas of expertise with regard to futsal. These guys are absolute experts in their field or deeply passionate about it or want to be. This is a grand coming together. We've got an hour, an hour and a bit here. We can chat this subject through. If you've got a question, please <coughs> just put your hand up and I'll get to you. State your name and what you do as well, if you would, please. And we can make this one enormous, great big chat for you to get stuff off your chest, to learn from the expertise. And please don't wait to be asked. If you want to argue with each other or whatever, just, just go for it. I'm going to start off running that away if we can, please. Will you just share with us your relation to futsal, how you got interested, involved, and how it is incorporated into your current role, and we'll, we'll move down the line as a starting point, please. Well, as a young person, I started with outdoor soccer, uh, as well as the other sports in America. And then I was drafted in 1978 to a new league that was started, it was called the Major Indoor Soccer League. Uh, so I was in indoor for 30 years, but in 1986, I was the captain of the U.S. national futsal team in the first international tournament that was held in Budapest. Uh, after that year, I really didn't touch futsal for 10 years, pretty much just was in the indoor soccer world. And then in 1996, my one of my coaches and my professional team was coaching Major League Soccer at the Tampa Bay Mutiny, and the first CONCACAF qual qualifiers were coming in, uh, in, in Guatemala. And he asked if I would take over the team because he couldn't make it. Uh, we won the gold medal in that first uh, uh, championship. Uh, the team went on to Spain. I did not go with them. And then in 1997, they asked me if I would be uh, the head coach of the team. And I told them no. I said, that's my coach's team. Uh, I've always been very loyal. And after a long conversation with uh, my coach, he said, I'd like for you to take it over. So for 20 years, uh, I've been the head coach of the national team. Uh, then became a FIFA instructor, uh, so I get to work with uh, Miko, uh, CONCACAF instructor, and then I'm also the technical director for the United States Youth Futsal, and then two years ago became the commissioner of, of the PFL. So uh, Futsal, like for many of us, uh, has been a huge part of uh, who I am and, and the passion that I love. Excellent, thank you. And Keith is doing his presentation tomorrow morning for those of you that are with us for two days. All people, <coughs> all people in Croatia were coming from starting with futsal. So it's the first step to, to become involved in what we call football is to start to play futsal. So after that, I made uh, some kind of career in football, but during the winter breaks, we are all playing futsal. <coughs> football players, futsal players, all together to play money tournaments. And this is 
interesting that uh, they now in Croatia we have three periods. Uh, summer money tournaments, three winter money tournaments, and all this. So we are never stopping to play. So we are playing futsal all, all the season, all the year. Then uh, when I was 26 years old, I moved to play in Italy professionally futsal. Uh, I went there just for two years to, work, to earn some money, but I stayed for 20 years. <laughs> then at the end I went back to Croatia. I took my national team as a coach, lead them for uh, almost nine years. And after that I made a short break. Then I got an offer. I got an offer from Finland and for already five uh, years I'm uh, leading the national futsal team and I'm also helping them to develop uh, coaching uh, education. I'm also a FIFA and UEFA instructor for, for coaching, so I can say that futsal is my life. Wow, that's some statement. And I do hope your wife is not watching. <laughs> <laughs> David. Thank you, Mr. Um, okay, so my futsal journey started in 2003. Um, we all play five side, right? Um, I play five side with my mates. We wanted to do something a bit more than just play, and we organised some fixtures, a tournament, and it was a five side tournament to start with. <coughs> and the second year of doing that, I wanted to make it something a bit bigger. Um, and my research led me to discover futsal, and I got in touch with FIFA, which put me in touch with the FA. Uh, and I saw this opportunity to to be involved in a sport that, that, was, that was so new in England. Um, I, I found a lot of tournaments abroad and I, I love travelling as well, so the opportunity to be involved in a sport and travel were what sort of hooked me in, onto foot up. Um, and I spent eight years up in the North East. Um, I spent eight years up in the North East at uh, Teesside University and Middlesbrough, where I my sort of love for futsal and part of my development, part of my myself, I, I knew I always had to go abroad to get some more knowledge of futsal. And Brazil, Spain, Portugal, in the end I went to Spain and an opportunity came about for me to go over there, coach over there, work over there. And, and yeah, I, I took it with with, with both hands. Yeah, so, so I had this opportunity to move abroad, um, and I did, I spent three years in Spain. Um, while I was over there, I took my monitor, which is equivalent to level one, um, and then I took my UA for B and UA for A in Spain, while working in a couple of top clubs, uh, a couple of professional clubs in, in Barcelona. Um, and yeah, I just, I had a passion for it, I followed, I followed that passion, and it took me, it took me to, to places that I would never have dreamed of going. And then all that experience, all that time spent sort of building myself up and getting the knowledge, it was it was with an aim, with a thought of one day getting a job in Futsal. It wasn't my it wasn't really my I'm not driven by money, but obviously we all need to make a living. So doing this over 12, 12 years was sort of to get myself in a position where if, if there were jobs in Futsal then I'd be a decent candidate and and then I got a call from Nicola Palios um, about the project here, and I was sold on it instantly. I think it's a great, great, great thing for the sport that football clubs are involved, and I've always been of the opinion that if a football club does cuts off properly, it can, it can lead to great things for, for the sport and for the club. Um, and that's where I am today. Um, the Tramio Rovers is the, is the head coach, and a lot more around that as well, as you know. Okay, well, we're going to come back to your Spanish journey in a moment. Ian. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm a little bit different than the fellas. Um, probably more football background, um, coming to futsal quite late. Um, but my whole working career has been in, in football as a, as a coach, as a, as a player developer, and then as a coach developer. Um, journey started through Bobby Charlton Soccer School, and, and I keep looking look across at Key. There's a definite reminder of <laughs> somebody that I've done in the past. The profile, look at the profile, it's insane. <laughs> 
So, yeah, it's warm me a little bit, actually. Wow. Yeah. No, 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 no. A lot of people are looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, so I spent some time with Bobby, which was a tremendous experience as a, as a young coach and learning the trade. Um, and then moved to, to Bolton Wanderers um, for the top 10 years while, in, while Sam Allardyce was there working in the academy, which was a wonderful experience, team doing really well. Um, and a lot of the stuff that Sam was bringing in was really unique. And he allowed the academy to sort of uh, move into loads of different areas around, playing in different ways. And one of the things we introduced was around Lots of small sided stuff for the younger and younger players, which was just a gut feeling we had that might help the players really, really develop. Um, obviously, people change up at the top of the tree and end up, up at the FA. So, I spent probably eight, eight or nine years now at the FA working as a regional coach um, and working a lot on, on coach education. Um, at the same time, I got involved with the Barcelona side of England team who played futsal, um, who at the time were. were, were we were just about getting out of group stage in qualification in tournaments. Um, and that's where I got introduced to the game. So um, Dan Ashworth gets appointed at the, the organisation, realised that, um, understood a little bit about futsal, saw presented something on the Advanced Youth Award around futsal and disability um, futsal. And he sort of made the link between, uh, the, we, we, need, we were looking for a skills coach, actually, like a skills coach to work in professional game to take. Um, some different ideas into the academy programmes. Um, Premier League had been toying with futsal and uh, uh, probably run that for the last five or six years. So they wanted the coach educated to deliver a, a futsal message within the, in the boys' academy programme. And, and that's kind of where they ended up doing most of what they're doing now. Um, so it's, yeah, it's banging the drum, that's, that's what we're doing. And, to, and, it, and it's moving forward. So that, and fair little things drop out and about um, other coach education within the organisation. So we've, we've been fairly positive over the last three years in, in trying to move that forward and, um, and getting the game out there. Okay. You, would you just pass the, the mic to Elle here, please? Yeah. Elle, would you just stand up for just for a second? Just, we're going to meet Elle tomorrow. He's going to do his presentation. But I want to, because of what you've done in Australia, I want to get your thoughts on the, the youth development process. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about your journey as well? Okay. Uh, Elle Abrahams. Uh, my actual name is Eldon, but tend to get Elton, Elgin, everything mm -hmm. else, other, but, other than Elton, so i um, just call me Elf. Well, we've had worse in the room this afternoon already. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, we call you Ben. Yeah, yeah so uh, I, know, I know how you feel. Uh, <laughs> but uh, obviously you'll find out more about what I do and what we've done uh, in Australia. Um, you've, also, you've probably also heard on the news in regards to where Australia is at the moment, in regards to futsal and the lack of funding and <coughs> the Australian team being cut and all the rest of it. Um, for me and for what we're doing, futsal is, as with you, is, is my life. And um, the thing that drives me in regards to futsal is those faces of the players that you're able to develop. So I think having this panel on what we're going to be talking about in the short discussions we had earlier, um, I think player development is a, uh, a very critical part of, of what we do and that, you know, basically, you know, shapes the players that we need for the future. So if we know what our goals are up at the highest level and we know where, what direction we want the, the players to go into, then um, I think it's important that we do the right thing in regards to their development. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to what has to be said here and hopefully... Um, we all share the same same thoughts, and you know, we can well, not too similar. We'd like a little bit of disagreement, otherwise it's going to be a very dull next hour. Isn't it? Well, thank you very much indeed. I'll pass that. David, start us off. I'm going to take this back to the lowest common denominator. So me sitting on the outside of it, I will know about Pele, Zico, about Iniesta, Cristiano Ronaldo, <coughs> Ronaldinho, talking about having a big chunk of futsal in their early football education. So as you see it, what are they taking out of that? And what's the relation to football, first of all? So the players you mentioned there, um, we all know that they started off in futsal. Um, from Neymar to Iniesta. Neymar and Iniesta are two different countries that do things differently, but they both started in futsal. Um, Iniesta's journey was, he played futsal out of school, so he was five, six years old, 
decided to go and play futsal with his local club because that was a sport on offer. You know, it's a pathway for, for players in Spain. Um, he played futsal until I think he was 11 or 12, I don't know if you know Pablo. Um, and at that age he then decided, well I want to give football a go. And he moved over to football and played for Albuquerque. Um, in that football environment, that's where he got picked up for Cresti Barcelona and, and the rest, we all, we all know its history. Um, so, in, when he, Iniesta was playing futsal in his, in his early days, from 5, 6, 7, 8, up to 10, 11, he wanted to play football. Likewise, when he went to Albacete, he, he then wanted to play futsal during that time either. His futsal background came at the first part of his life, and then he changed to football. Um, and, and that's certainly well. You can't really argue with that. Neymar, I'm not too clued up on the on the Brazilian system as quite as much as I am in the Spanish. But in Brazil, it's slightly different where they do mix football and futsal. And then at a certain point of their career, they they then choose. He could have been in one club and playing futsal, a bit of football, and then making that split later on in his, in his life. But yeah, they, they both. They both play futsal, all the players you mentioned play futsal as some part of their foundation is. Okay. Pablo, I apologise, I've just realised who you are. You're, you're from Real Betis, you're, you're speaking to us tomorrow as well. Are you happy to join in this debate a little bit as well, or do you want the afternoon off? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you just happy to sit there, or are you happy to chat to us as well? Just to continue with it. Well, I'll, I'll spread it about a wee bit. Um, okay then, meet you. Um, it's this relationship between futsal and football. We're in a football club that has a futsal team. We've just heard about the English FA starting to come round to futsal. As you see the relationship between the two, what is it, please? We have uh, <clears throat> different examples of good relations, like uh, Sporting Benfica, and bad relations like Bopatina uh, or Zagreb. We have just uh, the same supporters, but we are divided. And we are fighting <coughs> because in my country, not all football coaches, not all clubs, <laughs> like to see football progress. Okay. Yes, we can use football clubs to help uh, our our clubs to, to grow up, to to develop our movement. But uh, I'm really jealous on what we are, and I would like that we save our story, our independence and our culture in this summit. So whoever is helping us is welcome, but we have to be very careful to not forget where we're coming from and what we are. Are you saying you, you, you prefer to be not separate from football, but very much your own entity? No, we are, we are different sports. Okay. Yeah, no, I get that, but You'd prefer not to be a supply, seen as a supply chain to football. It depends on countries. In some countries, we are really divided. In some countries, we have to be connected to survive. In some countries, we are enemies. But we are making part of the same governing body, FIFA. And FIFA has made a lot of things to make our sport better. And I can say that I remember the first World Cup, 89, in the uh, Netherlands. And then the last one, there was a big difference terms of uh, excitement, spectacle and many other things. So we are really now great sport. We have a present but our future is really I believe right. With or without the football we are going to be great. <laughs> okay. but, but, well, the one thing I'd like to say is, you know, on on national <coughs> front in the United States, there's a young lad that everybody's talking about, it's Christian Pulisic. Uh, American players have a certain characteristic, big, strong, hardworking, fast, can defend well, um, sometimes lack a little bit of imagination, uh, but we're getting there much better. But Christian Pulisic, who now plays in Germany, uh, is a, a, a different player that we now have in the American team that maybe we've never had since maybe Claudio Reina. And, and why is Christian who he is, is his dad uh, played indoor soccer, with the boards, but also brought Christian into that world, which is, you know, small-sided games, but also brought futsal into Christian's uh, youth development. So if you see that this young player who has flair, imagination, and passion, 
and it was brought up through the game of futsal, especially in, in our country, as Pichu said, is that we, we have to be connected in order to market the game in the United States, that futsal and football are, are brothers. Uh, we are definitely you know, a sport on our, on our own, but there is a connection uh, across the table that we are together uh, to help both sides of the table. Can I have a show of hands, please? If you're here with a futsal affiliation to football, will you put your hand up now for me, please? If you're here purely with a love of futsal or wanting to build it, whatever it is, put your hand up now for me, please. So the vast majority here, no, maybe not a lot, but you didn't put your hands up there. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to work this out. Maybe it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To, to be behind the pack with something that seems so obvious. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, yeah I mean, for, for me, well, I think for the organisation, it's it's definitely it's both. It's not. There's two things going off. I think we've got futsal for the futsal and in, in improving the game and growing the game, and then we've got what futsal can do for football. Um, I think it's two different things, but then it's it's one of the same things as well. Um, I think on the one hand, they always think. I, I, so I end up speaking to futsal audiences where I'm sometimes seen as a football man. I go to, into football clubs and I'm definitely seen as a futsal fella. Um, and, and when you go to clubs, that's, that's definitely the case. Um, and we, we've got to grow both because um, when you see even at the younger end, what the Premier League are doing uh, and then the, the, the taking from the football clubs, and they recognise uh, that the opportunity that futsal is giving to develop players and that they're elite players um, and the players that will be playing at the top top level of the game they they are where our best players are playing i'm sure at the moment um, so that's recognized and, and it's not just what's out the, the the clubs and the premier league and, and the fa understand about the multi-format of games so it's 5v5 it's foot it's futsal it's 5v5 on course it's 7v7 it's 9v9 it's unloaded, overloaded games. It's lots of different formats. It's not just one thing, because the the, the prime objective of the FA is to, to develop footballers. Um, well, that's what we've been going. At the same time, 
this massive growth. So if, if futsal went off on its own and tried to do something, um, I think we'd struggle very much to get the same level of funding that what we're actually, what the football association is giving to futsal at the minute. And let's not underestimate that how it funds the National League. Um, in the last 12 months, Scoot has come on board on a, on a full-time role and to help to develop the elite um, program. You may just so, that is for so yeah, so so Max Cabal has come on on board since um, in the last nine months, um, full-time to work with not only the England team um, but also to work with to have a full pathway of players coming in um, from 17s upwards, really, and, and a little bit below. But again, we figure most players that will join that program will be dropping out of football at 16 and 18 and we can sort of give a soft landing to some of those players. So th there's an awful lot going off at the moment or going on at the moment. Um, we've got somebody that's just started, so Tina Reid started to work on development as well. Um, so I can concentrate on coach education, Mike can concentrate on elite development, Tina can work on development and, and suddenly we've got um, a, a a three-pronged approach of dealing with the politics within your organisation and making things happen. Um, we spend a lot of our time at the moment working politically to work with the senior management team of the organisation, which then accesses more funding and working with the board. Um, and we're really excited about what's coming. Really, really excited. Um, and because everything we do is, is positive, the, the clubs are buying in, um, you can feel it in grassroots that the county FAs are starting to understand more about where it might fit in terms of participation, so we're getting more young players playing, and um, then suddenly there's more under 15, 16 year olds that are coming to the England camps and, and, and wanting to play for the England futsal team, um, and, and everybody's getting more excited about it. And so I, I think we're definitely moving forwards in, in the right way. Um, the FA is a big ship that needs steering and it takes a long time to turn a bit of a corner. Um, but yeah, I can, I, I can feel it coming in and the excitement's there. Um, we've also got to remember about what we are as, as, as English people. Um, and, and you know, we've talked about having our own identity. And I, and I think, I mean, some of the disability teams have had some real success this year, beating Russia, beating Spain, beating France. Couldn't quite do the Ukraine, well, that was another story. But doing it in our own way. And I think that's something that we're searching for with the national side as well. But, you know, we, we, we will have to do this our own, our own way of it. So from a real football perspective, and, and Mike will talk about that tomorrow, I'm sure, um, that it, we shouldn't just be copying everybody. Obviously, we're looking carefully at what people are doing. Um, and the messages are well received when we talk <laughs> to the wider football community and where it might develop. Look at what Man United's done for the last 12 years. They've had a 4v4 programme for their under 6s up to about under, under 11s. They've banged the drum on 4v4, different formats of 4v4. No, it's not futsal, but it has developed players left, right and centre that are absolutely littered through the Premier League and the Football League. So, so when you speak to people like Tony Whelan, who's, who's driven all that developmental work at Man United, they understand the benefits of small-sided stuff. Which I'm not saying, but we've, we've got to be really keen that we keep that identity of what futsal can do. That's absolutely critical. Um, so not diluting the game in any sort of way because it's, it's just another piece in the jigsaw um, that will help us get even better England players. Even better England players. By the way, not a bad summer this year either in terms of what some of the younger age group in men's football teams have done. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's just another <laughs> piece in the jigsaw and, and I've, I'm pretty sure we're going in the right direction at the moment. Thank you. Would you pass that microphone? I was going to say, would you pass it to, uh, to Elf, please? Stephen, can I just ask you, would you see if there's somebody at Tranmere who could help to tune that microphone in? Because it's clearly going to crash, but I, it would help us immeasurably if we had two mics. Otherwise, I'm going to lose about three stone running around. So, you know, obviously, some of you might think I need to. Elf. Um, just something I wanted to bring up or ask, especially to the panel, was <coughs> you're talking about courses for courses and you know, different environments, you know, lots of different things. Uh, I'm not sure if, does everybody know what their end game is in regards to football? Like, you know, Just like for Tranmere, you know, what what is the club trying to achieve? What What's the ultimate goal of the club? You talk about, you know, you hear it often, people are saying, you know, 
the players want to get paid. If they were to get paid as much in futsal as in outdoor, they do futsal. And then you have the Federation talking about, you know, you've got out, outdoor clubs, <coughs> Manchester United doing five, uh, four a side, so they understand the benefits of what small sided games can do, but they're purposely not going in the direction of futsal. So they're not using futsal as a tool, they're using other formats. We've got 3v3, 4v4, 6v6, 7v7, and everyone's avoiding the futsal aspect. That kind of makes it hard to believe that they could coexist. Uh, in my mind, especially within Australia, it does make it hard. Yes, it's a good way to get a lot of people playing and the interest <coughs> up here in the game, but if you want the sport to grow and you want professional players in your sport, UFC did it with their own form of mixed martial arts. Um, you know, it's happened in other sports. So, just interesting to get your... Well, I'll tell you what, before we do, that. would you just pass the microphone to Takapak, please? Because you had... An interesting example. Then, I mean, you, you know, you set a very firm objective in Thailand. You knew exactly where you were trying to get with futsal. Because of the national teams, I mean, um, they're like the national pride, you know. Well, and also with your and own club that you're chairman of, by <coughs> being pretty clear along the way. Yeah, because we have uh, specific objectives, and um, we know that everybody we wanted the players and. The system has to come from a good, a good league, a competitive league. Uh, we cannot have too many teams, too many players. That is not good, not good enough. So we have to regulate every teams, every um, where do they live, where they pick the players, who are the players, where they register the players. So we keep the standards high. And with with that um, initiative from the government that. Um, we're trying to promote futsal in everybody's life, you know, futsal into um, their mindset. So they have to start playing futsal at a very young age. So six, seven years old, they will be playing futsal. And because of the Thai people that they cannot find a, a, a football court or an artificial glass before, they just play on the streets, they just um, play a small size game as we know that it will improve um, their skills. So we connect with them and and with the structures of the league that we know we have, you have to have um, a certain criteria that you can play and that you can um, participate and and the objective is to make, even though we want to make the national team better, but. We have to make um, every other things better as well, so that we improve together. You know, and um, I think it's uh, because of these criteria we have that um, usually, usually before the league, we have like uh, a tournament. Everybody wants to organize a tournament. They like to bring in local sponsors in and make money of it, pay the players extra. And then, but we have to formalize all of that. We have to get rid of that, like easy money um, tournament, and bring it to a format, into a league. And that's what we did, and um, and that's how we um, regulate and generate more players and more teams. So why, why didn't you <coughs> get to do that? And then we'll come over to Keith. So why didn't you join? A football club, or why did you feel there wasn't a need for you to be part of a Thai football club? Um, we wanted to be separate because uh, we, we know it's a, we talk about it, it's a, maybe a similar uh, sports underneath the same FA, but um, for our um, own, you know, sake that of the development, we, we don't want to join. Um, I mean, you have to talk back 10 or 15 years ago that Thai football is nowhere near. And even bad, you know, there's less interest in football than futsal in Thailand during that time. So more people were into, this is new, this is something that um, Thailand can do very well in the World Cup. So everybody is looking into futsal. But um, football during that time, it wasn't very bad. You know, politics were bad structures. So they turned into futsal, 
and the market turns um, the sponsor into food source also because it's a hot country in Thailand, you know, and, and um, the indoors with where, where the families come in to see the games. But um, the question is, because we, we have specific things that we differentiate from football, and and we don't want to be in. The FA actually um, have a guidelines for my um, company and my um, my father. You can do it. You can do it on your own because we didn't want to get involved with us. So after that, we made the food and then they come back to 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 talk to us and okay, let's form some partnerships or something. And then after that. It goes together. Let, what, 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 Keith, you were jumping in there. Sorry for the point. You moved on a little bit. No, that's right. Yeah, I, I, we all know that people don't like change, right? And, and the big, big reason why people don't like change is because they don't feel comfortable in the subject or the material that is present. I mean, look, look at the <coughs> cell phone. Right, the cell phone came, and I have a seven-year-old, and she knows how to use the cell phone and the iPad. And, and she's very comfortable with it, you know. Uh, for me, it took me time to kind of figure it out. It's not because I didn't like it, I just didn't feel comfortable with it. Uh, what's happening, uh, at least in our country, is you have older technical directors who don't know futsal, who don't understand it, who then can't coach it, so they don't then teach it, but the constituents within their club wants it. And we've been talking about the young man in the back said it all depends on different cultures, right? different cultures and, and philosophies, uh, how you're going to brace either futsal or football or, or combine them. I think part of the equation and the answer is in this club. Because with the responsibility that Damon has on the futsal side of this football club, is that they can create a different player in this club in England and that player comes in and stars on this pitch outdoor and then is sold for millions of dollars to let's say Man United then the story goes well, where did Damon come from Junior? You're going to have kids this Damon Junior came through Terminal Rovers and it was part of the futsal program that they had created this special player then what will happen? It forces other clubs to do what? It forces them to say maybe we have to embrace it it very confusing as I try to sell futsal is why people don't embrace it because Ian, you just said Man United plays small sided. Well, what does small sided do? Okay, on a small court, the physicality becomes much quicker, more agile. Look at the NBA. The NBA has many players now that are six foot five and seven feet that can move like a five foot eleven player. But why is that? Are they born that way? Or is because how they're brought up on the court as a young player. Then you can go through the technical aspect and the mentality and the tactics. It for me as a coach, as an instructor, now as a commissioner, it just makes common sense to me that if you're going to try to teach a special player and you can do it faster and quicker and become the end game is much better, why wouldn't you embrace it? So a lot of responsibilities on you now. And, and could you answer Elle's question as well with your end game? Absolutely, what you've been told by and your chairman. We went a bit around the way, but that's brought perfectly back to, to that question. I, thought, I knew it would, we've only got one microphone. Um, <laughs> so, the, the end game for Trammy Rovers. Um, you, you heard Mark Pius this morning, and um, one, one of his objectives, and one of our objectives, objectives as a club, is to be the best, is to be a leader in football. Um, he wants, I, I, had a, I had a brief conversation with him last week um, about Super League and said how things go in. He said, where do you think you'll finish? I said, where do you want to finish? He said first, obviously. Um, you know, he, he wants us to be top. He wants us to be one of the best teams in England, not the best team. But is that the only end game? No. Um, that's one of them, and that's what drives me, that's what, that's what drives the club. Um, but to do that, we need to do everything else properly as well. We, we need to develop players properly, we need to develop a structure. Um, I, I've got about a 12 point plan, and I think we only have point two, which first one was get the structure in place, get get the people to know about the club, 
and the second one is coach education and we're, we're just pushing on that a little bit now where we're, we're educating the coaches that are going to implement stuff that I've learned to our kids. Um, so yeah, the, the end game is to be a leader in futsal, to be to win things, to be success at Tramia Rovers. But a byproduct of that, and I think it is a byproduct, if, if they'd have called me up and said, David, can you come to Tramia and help us develop football players? I'd have said no. But a byproduct of that will be developing football players at some point down the line. And why not? Why not football? Why futsal? Why why are you so passionate about futsal as opposed to football? <coughs> That's a difficult question. That's futsal is what I've spent the last twelve years of my life doing, being involved in. Yeah, I'm a football fan, I like football, but it's not it's not what drives me. Um, maybe futsal football is saturated a bit, um, yeah maybe, but but futsal is what it's my passion. Um, I don't know how to explain it any other way. So if someone asks me to come and do football, I'll probably say no. Okay, right, I'm gonna ask a clearer question this time. How many of you would completely forsake football and just concentrate on a career business in futsal if you were given the opportunity? Put, put your hands right up so we can see, please. Okay. okay. And, and that brings me back to a conversation we had earlier about, I think I can count on one hand the amount of people that I know or have met that would say <coughs> they prefer football to futsal. That doesn't mean to say they do futsal over football, but perhaps they get paid in football and, and they always say, if I was to get paid to save in futsal, I'd do futsal. And so yeah, futsal for me is it's better than football, um, in, in my opinion, and it's my passion, that's obviously a, a matter of opinion, but um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be interested in developing football, but I know it's going to be a byproduct of what we're doing. And, I'm quite excited in the fact that what we can create in England is something different to what they've got in other countries. I think we've got different characteristics of children that if they grow up playing futsal, then we're going to create something, for me, something different in futsal, but then I think also in football as well. I like a new hands time. Do you know what? Unbelievably, I was going to come and pick on you and get a PFAs. I'm so sorry, I forgot your name. Mark. Mark. Yeah. What, what's the PF, you're from the PFA and we appreciate your sponsorship towards this. What's the PFA's perspective on Foot Sound Base? And the point you wanted to make. I think the perspective is that it should be mixed kind of thing for me. I know you say that you concentrate on Foot Sound and others just concentrate on football, but good football, as I think, play different sport, whether it's basketball or whatever, I think a mixture of Futsal and football will make better footballers and better futsal players at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's the way that's the way I look at it. And it's the same, you got cricket, you talk to a cricket coach, you said I know that the footballers are the cricket is because the way they move. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, why I'm excited about English players and the future of English players is because they are doing both. I've got kids once a week doing futsal but two or three times a week they're also doing football and I think that mix is going to create something very special. Um, in the Tramier Academy they do futsal during the winter as part of their programme. That, has, that serves two purposes, it helps their development, it gives them different skills, different, different aspects of their game, <coughs> but it also, it also gives them the, a taste of futsal so if and when they do drop out of football, because as we know 99% of the players won't make it, when they drop out of football, but Sal's going to be an option for them as well. So it's giving them a different development in their football career, but it's also promoting futsal from within over a course of 10, 15 years. Yeah, because just, just remember some of those footballers that are in, whether it's Tramira, that could be your future players as well. Oh, that, You're all looking after them at an early age, which I think futsal, futsal should be involved <coughs> in the early ages. The future players for you if they don't make it on this side. Oh, absolutely, and that, that's something we've got at this club that I think is quite unique, where we have got those kids playing futsal on a regular basis, um, and, and they will be signposted to our academy if, if they don't get retained by the Tramway Rovers, they'll be signposted to the futsal and, be, and kept in the club. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the kids that we've got in both the football and futsal academies are getting a very good mix of, of football and futsal. I mean, thanks. Those seem to be were they your, your personal opinions? I mean, I mean, where are the PFA with regard to futsal? Are they talking to players about it? Do you know where the vast majority of players are with regard to it? I think, as far as PFA is concerned, it's kind of it's kind of a new thing, uh, and the way we're looking at it is 
as far as we're looking at the transition, as, you know, we've got the 16 to 18 year olds, as you'll know that loans get released, don't they? So if futsal was involved at the younger age, I'm sure the transition from them going from uh, professional, semi-professional, whatever, into futsal would, would be easy. But I was talking to Mickey earlier that the <coughs> they haven't got that basis because they've not learned it at a younger age. And I'm sure the PFA would be concerned as far as that's concerned because we're looking at transition to our, to our players, whether it's the young players and the pros and the and the ex-pros, whether they can transition, whether it's in coaching or whether it's as players from the professional side into futsal. Well, I'm going to go forward to Ellen in a minute because he's got thoughts about this. Uh, I should say PFA for those of you from overseas, our professional footballers association. And also Ian mentioned Dan, he was talking about Dan Ashworth, who was the technical director of the FA. Can I, can I just jump in there, Mark? You can, can please. Uh, Mark's um, and point. I think what we're going to find now is players that are coming to 16, 17, 18 year olds and in the early football, they're going to be <coughs> more suited to go into futsal as a career path. And Maybe not as a career where they might, might earn lots of money, but certainly a career where they can go on to play for the, the national team in, in, in the FA Super League, which is obviously the elite in this country, and Ian's, you're, you're seeing that quite, yeah. quite, quite regularly now. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting, the, the, so we've got under 17s um, England side. <coughs> uh, we've got a couple of lads there now that are scholars at, at pro clubs that are coming into the England camps, and, and the clubs are supporting that. Um, so whether they're the big hitters within the youth teams at the pro clubs, we're not quite sure, but they are full-time scholars on scholarships and they're, they're, they're coming to camps at the weekend. Um, so that's a major step forwards for us. Um, we've had one or two, as I'm trying to think of a lot of Newcastle, who's, who's in the 23s at the minute, that hadn't really played football. He came through a futsal background and has got a pro contract at Newcastle at the moment as a lad player. Um, so we're starting to get those stories. When we look at the, the playing history of the, the current England team, a lot of lads have been to university, but most will have been in an academy programme when they were younger. So they dropped out at 16, gone to university, <coughs> and then come back and get England international caps through another way. So this very, it, it is working both ways at the minute. Um, and a couple of the ones that are around the sort of 17 years old, they're really excited because we don't know which way they're going to end up. But could be strong for the England team, which going back to end game, key things for England for the FA are England winning, whether that's football or futsal. So um, we're just finalising the strategy at the moment, and that is about qualifying for a, a World Cup or a, or a European qualification as a, as a country. Um, so that, that that's on the agenda, and it's something we're going to work really hard to, to go and achieve. Um, the other thing is about inspiring the nation and growing the game. So um, whether that's in football or football, it's, it's no different. Um, so we'll take that with us and we've got to make get more people playing, um, we need more refs to do exactly the model that we've been talking around this morning about more coaches, better qualified coaches, um, more kids just picking up the ball, playing and having a go. So I think we're, we're getting quite clear on, on where we're going and we have to align it with kind of football and keeping it on one side that it's separate and growing the futsal alongside as its, uh, as its little brother. Any questions or points from the floor, please? Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can indeed. I'll tell you what, I'll come to you in just a sec. What you yelped out a little while ago, Pete, were, were, were you in pain or were you, was it, <laughs> what was it about? Probably. Uh, no, I was just speaking from Mark there from the PFA. Um, it, it's, it, it's got to help each other as far as I'm concerned and obviously mentioned to you a little bit about the project that we're working on. Um, the best example I can give about it is my eldest son is 16, he's uh, a Liverpool football player now, 16 for the senior side. And we went to uh, Dallas uh, last year, Keith, and uh, he trained for six months uh, with the, uh, the Brazilian twins at uh, City Futsal. That's Connor, right? Yeah, I, uh, no, not Connor. Con uh, Connor is the son of Chase, yeah. who's my business partner. Uh, but yeah, my lad went to live with Chase and he spent six months at the IAD with City Futsal. We thought he'd be there 12 months. He was already a good footballer anyway. And after six months, Chase said you'll have to send him back home because he's just blitzing everyone here because he's picked up Futsal really quickly. So he came back home at 15, even though he couldn't sign for Liverpool as a senior player. He went training with them and he played friendly games and he's already registered for National League One. And we loves futsal and he loves his outdoor and he's already playing open age. It's just he's only just turned sixteen by the way, he's only playing open age. So it's helped him both ways. 
So that's why I was going to remark there on the PFA. I, 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 it should be supported on each other, but I agree with what David said. There is a pathway for both now. You know, and to bring the kids through the club, if it is the futsal way, that's fine, as in the PFL when it launches in America. So there's lots of opportunities here, but I think the biggest problem we have in the UK is, is a thing called the Premier League, because it's so global, and I feel it's the, the obstacle is in the way, because to break through on another football or futsal aspect, the Premier League has got to be broken down and break through, so we can get the football world going, futsal world going. And also we don't have facilities in the UK, in the UK. you know, proper state-of-the-art facilities like the IAD complex that we have in Dallas. It's a 100,000 square foot building, we state-of-the-art, purposely built for futsal. So there's, a, there's, a, there's problems and, you know, we're looking at addressing them. But I think that's the best example I can give you of my son going over there, coming back, and he's got both ways. And he's already been recommended by Ronnie to go to the England in the 19s. And so it, it can, it can work both ways. Ronnie. Uh, sorry, Ronnie Johnson. He's the uh, Liverpool football director. Thank you very much. I'd just like to join the dots of Steve. So Steve is fed us and giving you a staging tour. Just now he wants his two pound as well. Just, I feel really out of place because we're amongst coaches and players. For my sins, there's another referee in the room. So I'm not that, feel that bad. I'd like to ask Keith and Nico. Um, we're all going on about the players, the coaches and everything. How do you get the referees to be the quality of the players in America, Croatia? Because in England we struggle for referees. The referees we have are of an older generation. We can't get young kids to referee to the level of what the players are now becoming. Are we talking futsal here? We're talking We're futsal. Talking futsal. Well, we have got Mark who's obviously FIFA and Peter Nurse who have done the World Cup Finals. But how do you get your referees up to the standards where well, perhaps Mr. Alfred Gordon could be? I think this is an excellent question. When I went to Finland as a national team coach, the first thing I asked to the boss of Finnish Futsal is to talk to the referees and to tell them to live much stronger game. Okay? Because if we create difficult conditions of playing for the players, be sure that very quickly players are going to find answers for this difficult environment. So, let them fight, let them uh, have more difficult things to, to win against to become better players. So, small space is making better players. If you ask me if uh, Futsal is producing uh, excellent players 1v1, one one, I will tell you yes. And uh, this is what uh, from uh, football clubs can benefit, because our players if you want to survive or, or on futsal pitch, you have to dribble. You have to be good one v one. Okay. If you ask me if futsal can produce one uh, the players that are scoring goals well, yes, because in futsal <coughs> they are scoring some eighty percent of goals from one touch. So it means body position, other things that our players automatically learn. If you ask me why players are dribbling, not only because they take advantage one v one, but also to create passing line and these kind of players like uh, Neymar, Coutinho and few players that are existing actually in the world could, could come from futsal also. Uh, refereeing is extremely important from my side of, of view because uh, as I told, difficult conditions uh, uh, building better players. Uh, well, sorry, did you want to speak? Yeah, Keith, please. Great question, Steve. Just like we're talking how futsal helps the player, futsal also helps the referee in order to be a better re referee outdoor for the same reasons. I mean, he's got to think quicker, he's got to react quicker. He's got to manage the game a little bit differently. He has a coach standing right behind him, and it's, you know, more atypical coach. So the referee is extremely important. What I love about the futsal world is how us futsal people respect the referee and how important we know that the referee is to the education of the game around the world. Remember what I talked about is people don't like change. Baseball, football, basketball, and hockey have been around 100 years in the United States. Futsal, at the level that we're talking about, is in its infancy. So we're only at the beginning of this journey, and like coaches are extremely important, players are extremely important, so is the referee program. 
So to answer your question at the bottom level, Steve, is that what we're doing in the United States is referee education, referee education, referee education. And we're trying to get young people involved in the game. For instance, with the United States Youth Futsal, which is one of the organizations in our country, they actively go out, Ed Marco, who is the only FIFA Futsal referee instructor in the United States, he actually goes out and tries to recruit, along with U.S. soccer, young people, both boys and girls, who want to have a pathway uh, in referee, and, and they get them involved in our state IDs, our regional IDs, and our national IDs. And it's, it's interesting to me that when I see players fall in love with the game as a player, I see young people fall in love as a referee in futsal because they're more active in the game. So uh, the answer to your question, refereeing is ex extremely important for this, this phase of futsal that we're trying to, uh, you know, pass on the knowledge of the game around the world. Uh, while I, oh, sorry, yeah, please. Uh, Kit uh, mentioned uh, education. <clears throat> I believe education is a really a key to make our sport better, exciting, and our players uh, better. Uh, what I know is that FIFA is running futsal courses from 2005, and UEFA from 2015 is running the first uh, UEFA futsal B coaching courses. Now every country has to decide who, who are their national instructors. So if we find good instructors, we are going to, to have good coaches and at the end also the good futsal and good players. So education has huge importance how to develop players and our sport. Uh, I've got a question for you. Uh, I've had a question for you for ages, but I'm going over here. Sorry, I've forgotten your name. It's Alison. I'm awesome. a futsal level two coach with a couple of different companies in the country. Following on from that, I think the other area that we possibly haven't quite nailed yet is the language that we use around futsal and how we actually describe the sport in the UK specifically. Yeah. Because I think if we don't. If we don't uh, pitch it as a very aspirational sport, we're still we're not going to be able to convince the parents, hugely important, the clubs and the players. It, it will remain a subdued sport when clearly you know it could be and will be fantastic. But I think in our country we haven't quite. It's linked with the education, or it could link. But I think the language that we're using to describe it is still quite confused. I will pass you over to Ian, who will be able to answer on from, from sort of Federation's perspective. Um, but as I studied futsal in Spain and I did my badges in Spain, I'm now coaching English players and I'm, I'm using terminology that maybe they don't understand. It's working because I'm explaining to them what I want and we're understanding each other, but if I went to a different club, I'd probably, and different English players, I'm going to have to explain what I'm meaning by certain words before I sort of get into details with them and that's something that, that is being worked on at the FA. I'll let you in here, carry on. Okay. Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, Mike and I have been looking at a common language to use across the game and, and that's, we've, we've pretty much pinned that down, that's going out to the National League clubs from... Um, oh, oh, sorry? It's going out to the National League you clubs. You said somebody in you, you said. You said Mike. Mike, yeah, Mike. Mike, Mike. Mike's well. Sorry? Mike Stavala. Oh, sorry, there. Mike, we've not met yet. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Apologies, Mike. We'll, yeah. you're, you're with us tomorrow, aren't sorry, you? You're with us now, you. obviously. Please <laughs> <laughs> continue. Sorry. Yeah, so, so we've, we've come up with a common <coughs> language for, for positions and terminology. All right, so we think that's really, really key. Um, some of that we've taken from futsal from around the world. Other stuff we've tried to tie into the English football game because if it's if we're talking, we want football coaches to be able to pick this up really, really easy. And we need, um, and the players are saying if they're coming from one coach to the other. So some of that, a Brazilian person might go, what are you talking about? But actually it'll fit really well. So that runs through coach education, it, it runs through England teams and it'll run through the National League as well. So that, that's gone, gone really, really tight. Um, so, yeah, so that's, we've got what was the bit, sorry. I think sort of also I mean, around the branding, as in, yeah. you know, our families, our players, the whole community, they need to get more of a flavour for what futsal is yeah. and what it can offer to our children and our future players, not not necessarily just the technical language, I mean more of a 
what is futsal and why it is so, such a super sport to play? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, this, this, the, the, the comms department at the FA are having a good go at pulling different bits and pieces together, which is giving us more tools to take out um, when we're delivering courses. And, um, and again, so they, they, again, when we talk about the packing, having a, a big organisation behind you does give you the support from, from media and, and other departments. And so we're working on that, and that's, and that's coming together quite well. Um, and, and that's not to show if we've got stuff, we want to just get stuff out there. So all the resources that we have, whether it's coach ed resources, whether it's promotional resources, we just put them out there and we want people to use them. Um, it's not like sometimes if you do stuff with FIFA, we don't want to release it, we'll just put it out and off it goes. Um, I think the, be the best tool that we've got is that when people come in a month in with the National League, is that the product, if people come and see it, it's got to be the best that we can possibly do. Um, so there's been games down at Tranmere where there's been a couple of hundred people in here and the goal goes in and it lifts the roof off. Um, and it's a really exciting place to be. So my mother-in-law that has come to watch my son, who has seen him play loads and loads of football, within five minutes of seeing the futsal game went, this is pretty exciting, isn't it? And she's not a football person, she's not, she's not a sporty person, but she realised that there's loads of goal mouth action, um, the keepers are flying off and making saves left, right and centre, and there was loads and loads going on. So if you can convince her, it's an easy sell. The other easy sell that I think we've got is, is troublesome parents. So I've been taking my lad through that, through his football, um, junior football club thing, and I've got one or two parents who are lively characters and took a bit of dealing with. Um, when we started introducing them to futsal at 13 and 14, and the parents being in an environment that they don't really know what's going on, suddenly they're not that expert on everything, all right? And the biggest mouth suddenly shut up, and they went, oh, this is quite good, isn't it? And they sat there quite as mice because they didn't really know what's going on. But that was giving them a really good experience, giving the kids a really good experience when they came through the door. Lo and behold, we've got Jordan Ace now playing in the England team, who came just through that pathway, giving him a, a good taste of something. He has a choice to go down and get paid 300 quid a week playing football, or do we go and play for free for Manchester and get an England cap? He's chose to go and play for free and go for the caps, rather than playing non-league in steps six, wherever, and earning a few quid. And so I think if we, we've got to, you know, as coaches, we've got to go, this is going to be good when people come through the door. El, can I ask you, um, have you got to be fairly selfless to be a futsal coach, in so much as if you do get one to a peak, there is every chance that a football club is going to come and make them the chance of that exercise of staying with futsal, I guess, in the current fiscal environment, is quite slim. Did you? Was, there was kind of a question in there. Did you understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, can you repeat? It? No. <laughs> um, I think it's, and I think this is where futsal potentially gets held back because everything that everyone's been talking about is the goal for the player is to become a football player. So they've only made it if they become a football player. So the concern then comes from a futsal coach. Yes, I've developed this player. He's now gone on to be a great football player, which is exactly what you want. Everyone's happy. But how does then that affect your goal as a coach, coaching a futsal team? He's your best player. But you have to let him go to another code. Um, you talk about the player that had to make a choice of making a couple hundred quid playing football or getting some caps. Why why aren't we looking or why isn't anyone looking at trying to get that league, a futsal league, to a point where that player is choosing between 300 bucks or 300 bucks playing futsal? You know what I mean? So all of a sudden, there's actually more value in the futsal as well. So that decision for that player to make is a little bit easier. I, I don't know, your thoughts? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think culture is it's a massive challenge in this country. And again, it comes back to understanding what, what this country is all about. We're not a country that really does court sports. Um, you know, we're, we're, the, the football football is, is huge. So you go and watch Warrington Town, Evo Stick team on, at the weekend in the FA Cup pre-qualifiers and there's two or three hundred people there, which is a decent crowd and the, the players are getting paid for pretty decent money. 
Um, I think the, the, the model that we might have to follow as an organisation is, is we, we're probably where the women's game was probably 10, 15 years ago. Um, they got around it with central contracts. So does the governing body go, do you know what, for England players, we offer central contracts. And then suddenly we can start attracting players that might be tempted towards um, Conference North. And because they're probably a better, some of the players might kill me if you see this. <laughs> But they, they, they probably, well they know that there's probably better raw material that might jump ship and come over to Futsal. So again, that's for us politically to find a little bit more money, get the central contracts. Um, I mean, the England players now are in every fortnight now throughout the season, in addition to the National League games. So we're getting contact with the players and, and with, the, with, with some of the 17s and the 23s as well. So we're getting the contact and they're doing it for free. If we could get the contact and we're paying them, then suddenly, you know, we're on a winner. Um, so we've got a plan, it's, we've got to find the part of money now, does that come from the Federation? Is someone out there that goes, you know what, I fancy backing this because I really believe in what I'm doing. Um, you know, that, that's, that's probably the next step. And that's where I think, you know, you're talking about, should it be the FAs, you know, they have to go to find the pot of money, they have to go. So you also mentioned before, you know, the Federation's also got things that they've got to do with football and you know they've got targets they've got to achieve there so you don't want to you know be taking from one to fund the other one and, and that sort of thing so is that then an opportunity for some sort of independent you know party to come in and you know it's their job to go and get the extra funding and all the rest of it yeah absolutely if, if there's other ways of doing it then then absolutely terrific and then because Think about what the FA does, we do England teams, we do coach education and we look after the grassroots game. That's what we do. We don't do leagues, we don't do it. So, you know, we've got to be really careful about seeing what we're good at. I know who is about to do leagues, Keith Bobby Charlton. <laughs> tell, us, tell us what you're up to in the States. This is, this is big leagues, you've got some big players involved in what you're, you're in the process of setting up. Uh, well, I don't want <laughs> get my presentation out since I'm first oh, in I'm the sorry. order. Yeah, yeah. But let, let's talk about patience. If people were making millions of dollars in futsal, this room would have to go all the way down to the next city, right? And again, we're just in the first phase of the growth of this game. So if people are making millions in this game, let's just say players, you know, when they get to a certain age, they'll have a, a certain pathway to go. I'll go left, I'll go to football, I'll make whatever, and I'll go right, and I'll go to futsal. Uh, and then the next phase down the road is he'll just be a futsal player or just be a football player. We need more players like Rick Advino. If you've seen Rick Advino play live, I mean, he could not be a better <coughs> person than to market the game of futsal, not only in Portugal, but around the world. And there are more players that are coming out that hopefully will be Rick Advino's. And by the way, we know the young man because he was just with the PFL event. Not only is he a great player on the court, but he's a tremendous ambassador and a great uh, man of character off the court. And those are the players that, that we need to, to, to push the game. So I just say that everybody is patience. You know, I wish I was 30 years younger uh, because I've been selling this vacuum cleaner for 30 years and no one really wanted to buy it. Now everybody wants to get one. So I think what we're all doing is, is trying to figure out what is the best pathway to get there. And what I love about this conference, and, and Miko and I, and Dana, and some of you live in the world, it's all about the coaching, right? Teaching players, teaching referees. But this is about the business side of the sport. This is probably more important now than the education of the game. Because you can have great players and even great coaches, but if you don't have great owners and you're not making money, you don't have an organization, you don't have a team. So that's what I was so excited about coming uh, represent the PFL, is, is you know what can happen around the world. We know in the PFL the responsibility that we have, not only to our league owners, but the responsibility that we have globally to the game around the world. As well as around the world as to the game itself also, is that how well can we make this game in order to help each other. Because what Pablo does his job in Spain, it helps the United States. And if someone does in Portugal, and Mitro in, in Croatia, it only helps the game. And, and we know that because of the level of owners we have, and the marketing and the advertising, 
that maybe we can kick it up one more level in order to help the rest of the people. Our player salaries will be somewhat different. You know, where you have professional leagues around the world, and, and what is the definition of professional in the dictionary? Underneath the word professional, does it say you make a million dollars? No. The, the, underneath the definition, it says someone who works hard and he's talented and he gives everything he has and he wants to learn. Uh, I think that's the definition of professional. So there are leagues around the world that the business side has not worked yet. And the one thing that concerns me is I do see great videos of players and teams around the world, but the first thing that I look at as a commissioner is not the product on the court. I'm looking at how many people are in the stands because that's the next phase of my life. I went from a player to a player coach to a coach, now to the business side of the game and how we promote it. We'll actually have three levels of salaries in the PFL out of the first 12. And the first four make $5,000 a month, the next four, uh, 4000 and the final four, 3000 along with the housing and health insurance. And then we have an exceptional player contract where the one player can make up to $150,000. We understand that that is a lot of money, not for maybe the Spanish League or for Ricardino, but for the majority of players around the world. It's an opportunity for them, for referees, and for coaches there, and that's what we're excited about. Wait, we haven't been to the Iberian Quarter in all this debate, would you? What are your thoughts on what you've heard, Antonio? From, from Sporting Club Braga, for those that weren't there with us this morning. Yeah, uh, just speaking of what you just said about uh, um, turning uh, the sport into business, and uh, it's all about making money as well, as well, and you should not forget that. And you're talking about, you know, the qualified uh, coaches, uh, referees, and management, and managerial skills are also important to run the clubs. And uh, that's becoming uh, increasingly important in uh, as when, when the leagues get more competitive uh, because uh, you have to make sure you're using the resources right and, uh, and you get the people in, in, uh, coming and watching the games. Uh, once again, the, the, in this workshop we had with the FA, uh, the, the, with the clubs, the FA had with the clubs, that they called the marketing guy from the FA and we were there listening to him for about an hour. Uh, telling us how to get more people on the ways of getting more people on the on the on the, on the sports hall to watch the, the, the matches and what you can do with the fans and not with the fans and to bring them back uh, back uh, to bring them more and more to watch the games. But uh, it is uh, uh, a very important point the one you made. So Pablo, any thoughts? Any, any thoughts? I absolutely agree with Kid that it's not only the, the players and the training, but you have to have a, a big structure around it because the structure uh, the, uh, stay always in time and you need to grow uh, a bit of structure for all the, the clubs, the sport, the player. But it's true that if you get the best player, it's come with it. You know, the, the sport is growing, it's also the teams. And I don't know who is the league now. I suppose you tomorrow are going to talk about this in the state, no? Oh, no, I got shut down on that one. There was no way to answer that today, was that? I prepared a presentation for an hour and a half. I'm not splatting it all out this afternoon. That's a funny shot. That's a funny shot, I'd say, yeah. It's uncanny, mate. Now we actually look at it. Um, I'm, I'm going to spring this on a friend of mine. I always do. Nigel Atkins is with us, the football manager. Of course, did the double promotion with Southampton a few years ago. Uh, in just 20 months. Um, futsal, any, I mean this is a very progressive football club, Southampton I'm talking about, a any sort of integration down there, any involvement of the players with it? We didn't have it down in Southampton but we did it in Reading. I was the manager of Reading in the Premier League and uh, it was something that we looked at and we talked about development. I think we talked about developing players, touching the ball more times with a small ball in futsal is so important. I think one of the issues we've got in our country is maybe facilities. You know, the Football Foundation, for example, have gone all of a sudden have helped a lot of uh, communities, if you like, get AstroTurf pitches or 3D pitches. I think for us to help develop futsal, you need to get more facilities in areas because at the end of the day, you've got to get kids playing. And again, the amount of young football players, or young players, young people, boys and girls, who stop playing sport and fall out of sport because they haven't got the facility, they haven't got the belonging of being part of a team or an organisation, the mental well-being that goes with it all, it, it, it's all relevant, you know, and I think 
you guys in this room now, it's the first one that you've got. I've been privileged to come sit and, and listen to some good things. You're the driving force now. You've got to take it forward and you need support. And, you know, as Keith said there, it's in its infancy. You know, America's probably ahead of the game, for example, at this moment in time. But in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time, where, where could it be? We need young people in our country, for example, participating in sport. You know, I was at a conference yesterday where we talked about over 55s being involved in sport because they need to be a, 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 a belonging to a community to keep yourself healthy, to keep yourself fit, to be, have the interaction with people. Now, across the board, this can help in so many ways. And you guys are talking about the elite level now, about whether you get paid or you don't get paid. That's maybe not for now, but it's in the future. So if you can get the facilities right, you get the kid, the youngsters out playing, enjoying it, participated in it, and as you know, it was mentioned there about the mother coming in just to go and watch it, oh, this is fantastic. <coughs> People going to, so for example, Tramio, the community, Tramio of uh, the Wirral, come to Tramio Rovers to watch an event. You know? That will then help to get more people through, sponsors then get involved, and it will grow. It's all about growing the whole game. Now, from my point of view as a, as a football manager, we always look at the academy players and stand in. We do loads of street football, for example, when we were ready. We did the uh, foundation for the street football, small sided games. You look at the video this morning of the, um, the guys who were out in Thailand playing under the, uh, under the, the motorways. As young kids, that's what we used to go and do. Just find a plot of land, just rock up and go and play. I, I was brought up on the world, that's what we used to go and do. Just find somewhere and just everyone just rocking, play when the bell goes for dinner, or you, whatever you've got to go off, you go off somebody else. You just keep going. I think we need to drive it as much as possible and to say you guys need support to make it happen. Um, and it's great to see so many people who want to go and do it. And it will develop a player whether he's going to play futsal or he wants to play football or he wants to play rugby. It's decision making, it's all being part of the team structure. It's whatever you want to go and make it. And then you talk about there's the elite level. Maybe that's a little bit further down the line, but you've got to, you've got to dream about getting to, to that situation. So it's, it's an all-encompassing thing, it's a lot of things. And you guys in this room the bottom, it's you're the drivers for it. Because this is the, I think it's the first uh, is it the Futsal Focus Network business conference. So you're in the room, so you've got passion about it, you want to drive it, you need support, you need to interact with each other. And you've got to take responsibility to say, how can we push it on and make it, and make it happen? I think it's a great thing. A question for you though. Yesterday we met briefly at Soccer X. Uh, yesterday we met briefly at Socrax, and just before I met you, actually, I was at uh, Fluminese talking with them uh, at their booth, and a couple of guys came across and heard our conversation that I was from a futsal background, and they'd heard of futsal, and they, they knew very little about it, and the Fluminese guy said, everyone on this wall, all around, all the players that was on the wall, all top players that we've seen at United and go on into Milan and everywhere else, go on to Inter Milan and United and everywhere else from Fluminese, they all developed through futsal from no age to 12, only futsal. The play, some of the coaches who I met later, separate to this, said, I love futsal, but my director of my academy won't have it. How do you think we change that type of attitude, you know, with, um, with football clubs? People don't mind change, good question. People don't mind change. I knew from my own experience of being down at Reading, we were, and I just got the go ahead to start it now. We were going to develop a new training ground. We had new homes coming eventually. Uh, we, we built, we found a plot of land, and in the plot of land that we were going to have, we were actually going to have uh, air, if you like, underneath some ground we'd actually uh, figured in to have a futsal stadium. So it can happen. Um, the funding is in place in the academies. How are they going to utilise it? I mean, they're probably on the the ECPP, for example, is probably on the second or third uh, order now. They've got to use money a little bit different in a, in a different way. Using the facilities in there. Mm -hmm. But I think it's got to be through the community. How do you grow it all? Can you get every... the world, you know, you go to Manchester, you go to all the different places around the country. Can they give something back to the community? It's a, it's a facility to start off with. Like mm -hmm. Frenton Park here, you know, I made, I made a debut years and years ago. You know, it's great to come back and, and see it. Prenton Park was a, is a major player in the world, for the community of the world. So there's a lot of football clubs all the way around the country. 
why can't we have a facility, a futsal party, as part of the, of the football of the community? Well, I tell you what, let's put Ian Bateman on the spot again. Here we go. <laughs> why can't we, Ian? Have you got the microphone? I've got it, yeah. I'm alright. I've not got broad shoulders, so we're okay. <laughs> No, nice. Yeah, no. A um, couple of things. Oh, no, just 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 picking up on that. Um, one facilities. So I think Nigel and I are probably about the same age. If you, probably. But we went. If you went to school when I went to school, you got there early and you played on the yard and you played in your school shoes and you probably played with the smaller ball and you probably narrowed off the goals to make it. A little bit, so you weren't fagging the ball when it got booted, for, and so you had to get the ball a little bit closer. To That's what you did. You played before school, you played a break, you played at lunchtime, and sometimes you even stayed out of school and that had a bit of a bumble as well. We probably had something that was really quite close to what we got. So to, to keep the emphasis of the game, what we're saying is we need to be playing on a court, we need to be playing to the goals, we need to play the rules, we need to play with the ball. Okay. Um, and to do that, we've probably got loads and loads of netball courts marked out in every primary school across the country. So an easy, really easy fix is, is getting some goals out onto the netball <coughs> courts. We've, we've got um, Football Foundation money now that's secured specifically, that can be accessed to the county FAs, um, for goals and balls. And, and it's, it's really, and, and a little bit of coach education as well. Um, so that money is now available from pretty much next month uh, and is accessible, which gives us a real starting point. So when, for November, it's about to start raining. If you live around here, it rains from about end of, well, mid-November till about mid fair All the grass games will get called off, but it's pretty much dry on a Sunday morning when everybody wants to play. So if we can affect the mentality then to go and play on the hard surface, because that's critical to the game to keep, keep as true to futsal as we possibly can. We've probably got a really cheap solution um, to some of the facility issues. Most of the councils are in Warrington. There's eight floodlit mugger courts that you can buy a, not buy, you can get a license off the council for free to have a floodlit court all through the winter. Wouldn't cost a bean to go and trade, which is a massive difference than renting out a 3G at 50, 60 quid for an hour for you to train your team on. So there's some really, really <laughs> easy wins. Um, the nice bit is to come and play at Tranmere on the fantastic wall that's marked out and it's warm and it's dry and, and you're not getting wet week in, week out. So we have got, I think there is some cheap solutions if, if we really think about it. Um, and playing on a hard surface offers a different challenge to, to what we would bring on 4G. Um, so, you know, it's, I don't know, there's some, I don't know if it's in the presentation tomorrow. A little bit, but... Uh, <laughs> Coach, great two comments actually. One is facilities. I mean, for us in this business, we if this was a restaurant business and we wanted to sell <laughs> Italian food or Irish food or American food or, or food from Thailand, but we don't have a restaurant, well, what are we doing? We're talking about we got a great chef, we've got great food, but we don't have a restaurant. Well, how are you making money? So facilities, of course, is extremely important. Um, when I first drove up here with Steve and I looked at the parking lot, every parking lot I see, I see a futsal court. And out there, I see a huge futsal tournament because all you gotta do is align it with painter's tank because it's easy to put up and put down. And as you said, we need to get players playing, we need to get coaches coaching, and we need referees to, to, to referee the game. So that was great. The other point you made, 55 years and older, to get them back. When you said that, because I'm older than 55, I was like, wow, what are the stupid things to say? Because we're so concerned about four or five and six years old, and then they get 16 and turn pro. But what a great demographic to try to get back into the game is people to get on a court when they're over 55. In, in Brazil, they call it showball, you know, 77, where people like us who grew up with football, we don't want to run 100 yards anymore. We want to go out and keep the ball around in a shorter space. Well, what not better is the game of football. So, Coach, I love that point. Quickly, on your point about Fluminense, well, how do we get that guy who doesn't believe in it? <coughs> I go back to patience again, and then I go to examples. And what I mean by that is the DA, the Developmental Academy Program in the United States. Four years ago, U.S. Soccer told all the academies across the country, you must play futsal during the transitional periods of November through March, cold months in our country. However, Florida, Dallas, and, Los and Southern California said, 
Well, why are we going to play futsal? We, we're outdoors all year long. So what I'm talking about patience is, is when New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago kids and their academies play those warm weather academies, and their players are somewhat different technically, tactically, physically, and they start beating the warm weather the states, then it's going to go to back to what? To an example. They're going to say, well, how come you guys are a little bit better than us? And if they're able to say through the game of futsal, then you're going to have the people change. That's how I think it's going to happen. Patience, patience, patience. Listen, this is a pretty unique occasion to have so much expertise in one room. Is anybody willing to share their futsal business model with us? Anybody got a problem that they like to put to the group? Anybody want to chip in a question or make a point on anything we've done? Anybody at all? Uh, okay. Could they, I was going to say, <laughs> could the person <laughs> diagonally as far from me as possible please put their hand on? Obviously, it's a futsal question. Yeah, you're not going to tell us about it. No, it's a futsal question, yeah. Because um, we all fear for business and about making money. I know that in Asia last year or just a year gone, uh, they put up a program where they got players around from around the world to promote the futsal. Now, Ryan Gates was one of the players, and you had Ronaldinho, you had Ricardo. Um, there was the USA that put Team Falcão and Team Ricardinho as well, I think last year, or uh, to promote the futsal, if I'm not wrong. Do you think England should, or the UK should be thinking about the same to try and promote, to get those sponsors, to get that money involved in futsal? Uh, who, who, do any of the... What? Ian, Big yeah, let's start with Ian, and then and then maybe David can pick up. Well, no, David, you can start if you want to. If you want to, what do you want to do? Ian, go on, Ian. Let's you do it. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I think there's, there's, an, there's an exciting stage for me that's coming where um, I think we've got to back the sort of the, 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 some of the younger generation that's coming through. So we've got to be strong about if, we, if we're going to put our money anywhere, let's get the young people that's coming through, play national league, get them into the England team, and make the England program right. Um, I'm not so sure by if we, if we take ex players, ex footballers out, what could, I think we've got to get our product right with the England team and get the product right in the National League and spend the money there because the cost of probably, I don't know what Ryan Gates got for going and playing in India, but that could blow our budget right out of the water just to get him to play in one game. And, and for me, that's probably not, not the answer. Yeah, I think, I think these events uh, are all well and good, but I think the most important thing to grow the game is developing clubs. Clubs that can develop a following, that can then spread past through generations, and um, something that's sustainable long term. Um, yeah, I think while, while these events are great and they can be a, a sort of a trigger for further things, I think we need to develop clubs, develop communities, and, and focus on that rather than than these events, but if we can do both, then, then why not? Miko, I haven't heard from you for a while. Have you any sort of uh, winding down thoughts on what we've been discussing this afternoon? What advice, as, as a futsal legend, what advice would you give to us? And somebody that's been running your website for the last 20 years, what advice would you give us? Right, futsal planet. I was <laughs> living for almost 20 years, yeah. and I lost my hair. Okay. You want to give the website? Yeah, it, well, yeah. W you, w you're not going to complain that you've lost your hair when you look at us two on the end, are you? <laughs> Good <laughs> lord, <laughs> you've still got plenty compared to me and Bobby. We are the legends with the football stars. And yes, promotion could be done, but uh, I think this is not the real futsal that they are playing. Futsal is something about uh, difficult conditions, decision making, uh, decision under the pressure <coughs> of transitions and when Ronaldinho is playing his kid he's showing the tricks or... I don't like this kind of, of futsal promotion it would help but okay. futsal is completely different ok and, and actually I was going to start with this question but I'm almost going to end with it <coughs> because there's a bit of mystique about the Spaniards that you wanted to deem it isn't it Damon? Just in terms of where it's kind of placed in our psyche, that it, that futsal has some mystical quality over there, but you found that having 
been out there for a few years. It's not yeah, so quite the reality. One of the one of the biggest selling points we use in England to sell futsal is, and I'll, I'll be very specific, it's come play futsal, it's great for your kids, and Barcelona use it in their academy. We've all heard that, right? At some point in our career, some point in our sort of promotion of futsal. Um, I'm not one to say things that I really know in sort of the background of it, so... Except he did over lunch, and that's why I brought it up now. <laughs> and by the way, if he in any way slags off best, it's nothing to do with me, okay, Pablo? So, when I was in Spain, I, I asked the question to people at Barcelona, um, how often do, do Barcelona football academies play futsal in their, in their programme? And he looked at me with a face like this, like, what are you talking about? And, and they don't. Bar Barcelona football academies don't use futsal for their children. Is that wrong or right? We don't know. Um, but it's something that doesn't happen in Spain. Futsal and football in Spain are two very different sports, much like basketball and handball are very different sports, different pathways. And yes, yeah, it's, it's a big myth that, um, that we discussed earlier as um, something that perhaps we need to... What's the word? Um, Mythbuster, Mythbuster. Debunk. Does that, does that fit with, is it being fair and accurate there, Pablo? There's a difference going in what you said before about the Iniesta. In Spain, in all the schools, in all parks, in all the streets, there is a court for playing football. So all one sometimes in life has played football. All one. Yeah. And that's why I said that uh, Barcelona players have been playing football. They have been playing football in a scholar age. Sure, but not in their career like like there. Yeah, absolutely. So they've all, they've all played it, they've all played it in school. Their introduction to football most likely is futsal. Um, but when they go to Barcelona Football Club or any football club for that matter, futsal isn't part of their training programme. That's not to say it's wrong and it's something we are introducing the tram here and, and in other clubs around the country. And let's just box everything off because you feel we didn't quite give a, an answer to that. Oh, we've got a question here. I'll tell you what, we'll deal with that one, then we'll do that one, and then I've got something very special to do. Keith, you want to say no, something? No, I, I think my colleagues answered the question. Okay. Well, I just want one step further. If I'm opening up a basketball league and I want to promote it, I don't want to bring in a baseball player. So to answer your question is, in the United States, we have to travel long distances. LA to New York, it took me a long time to come here. In Europe, your countries are so close together that if I was promoting futsal here in England, I would look for Ricardinho, I would look for Cardinal, I would look for those players that when we brought Ricardinho and Falcao to the United States, now remember, other than futsal people in the States, they don't know who those players are. Those guys are like pie pipers. They, they, they were so fantastic for our event, because not only did the futsal people know, but the futsal people told soccer people, football people, about them so they would come. And they they are not professionals that would show up and you pay them money, and then as soon as the clock hit 10 o'clock, they walked out. They signed every autograph. They talked to every owner. They hugged every person that could hug and took photographs. So for me, with England being so close, to some of the best professional futsal leagues and players in the world, me personally, I would recommend to reach out to them. And, and you have men in this room that are connected personally to them and say, let's do an event, let's have an exhibition game, let's have an autograph session, let's, let's open my restaurant and bring you in. So in my belief, you have a huge opportunity because you guys are so close together. Thank you very much indeed. Let's have a, a, a question to finish. That word's question point. Uh, I would like to share my business. Uh, oh yeah, please. So what's your name, please? My name is Dragomir. I'm from Moldova. Uh, I'm president of Futsal Club Victoria Bukan. And uh, we have uh, three years of activity. Uh, my business model is based on the, uh, a Futsal facility. Uh, because uh, the well-organized Futsal facility uh, is the success of uh, the club because you can earn money and, uh, with uh, stars from football it's, uh, it's good to inform people what is football because I'm sure that in the uh, UK also in Europe most of people 
uh, know only about football, but not about football. So sorry, just to clarify, you have a futsal festival on a ring? No, I have a futsal club. A club? No. Did, did you not say festivities? Facilities. 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 Sorry. Facilities. Sorry. Facilities. Sorry. Facilities. Sorry. Sorry. Now I get the context. So, uh, uh, my name but in the uh, UK, the most important uh, point of development is the uh, futsal facility. But based it on live stream and well organized with uh, minimum 1,000 seats for supporters. Yeah. <laughs> Although, as we've also discussed, as Nigel mentioned about the the, the rocky ground, as Takapan mentioned this morning when he showed us that amazing photo of that pitch that was almost went like that around the corner. I mean, sometimes you just have to have the passion and get out there. Exactly. And, and Dragon Gear's model is pretty much similar to what we're doing at Dragon uh, The facility that we've got out the back, Rose Leagues and our Futsal Academy, and that is an income stream for the club. And it, as, you know, if Mark's invested in it, then you know, he'd be very, if he was here, he'd be saying you know, for all football clubs, for all people with interest in the game, we develop the facility and it, it can be an income stream, which can then lead into developing other parts of the game, which you know, is the Futsal Academy and the, and the first team. Brilliant. Guys, I, I, I hope you got some enjoyment out of that. I hope you have as much as I did. It's flown past, believe it or not, we've just spent an hour and three quarters. I just want to say a big thank you to Nigel for his contribution, to El, to Takapa, to Antonio, to Pablo, to Keith, to Miko, to Damon, and to Ian, and to Stephen who chipped in there as well. Will you show them your appreciation? Please?